Stories of Lincoln Park. And I'm honored to introduce our guest today, George Rammel, who many of you know. George was born in Cranbrook and studied at the Vancouver School of Art, which is now, of course, Emily Carr, from 1971 to 75. He's been active as a sculptor and an art instructor since 1975. He taught at Emily Carr Institute over an eight-year period and worked as a studio sculptor and project manager for Haida artist Bill Reed, among other prominent artists. George has been a longtime faculty member with the Studio Art Program at Capilano University, where he taught for 24 years. In addition to three European sculpture symposia, Silveretta Atelier in Southern Austria in 2012, Brittany, France in 1990, Helsingborg, Sweden in 1988, and a second residency again in Helsingborg in 2013. George has participated in 18 exhibitions, including solo exhibitions at the Burnaby Art Gallery and the Charles H. Scott Gallery. George's sculpture and mixed media work is currently on view at the Gordon Smith Gallery in North Vancouver, part of the Art is Work exhibition, which runs until October 14th. Today we are pleased to be present as George unveils a new work. To give you some context for the unveiling of this sculpture, the program in which George taught no longer exists. In 2013, Capilano University's president, Chris Bullcroft, announced the studio art and textile programs, along with computer science and adult basic education, would be ended. Although the faculty of Capilano University attempted to convince the president that her unilateral budget cuts canceling the programs violated the University Act, she deflected criticism. And when her administration seized and destroyed faculty pro protest banners, George resorted to satire. He sculpted a caricature, a ventriloquist puppet of the president and her poodle, entitled Blathering On in Christendom which he used in various protest venues. The university responded by seizing the work, holding it for 53 days, cutting it up, and returning the parts to George. This disturbing event involved multiple violations of George's academic freedoms, including the ongoing censorship of his sculpture from the university's campus. In a subsequent court case brought forward by the Capilano Faculty Association, it was determined that the university had indeed violated the University Act. In spite of this, the programs remain terminated. This past month has seen the tools and, equipments and equipment of years of studio art thrown into dumpsters and hauled away. We in the province of BC are all poorer for the destruction of a very fine, long-standing art program that had the strong support of thousands of people in the Lower Mainland and North Vancouver in particular and it remains to be seen what can be done to reinstate or revive this program for current and future generations. George has responded to the destruction of his work and the programs by incorporating the returned parts from the original piece into a new sculpture entitled Margot and the Monarch. He has made this new work in appreciation for all the teachers and students across North America who weighed in with comments and papers supporting academic and artistic freedom. On a personal note, I should tell you that I had the great good fortune to study sculpture with George at Capilano's Art Institute in the early 90s. Among all his former students and colleagues, I can testify that George's extraordinary knowledge, passion, and commitment to sculpture makes him one of the finest teachers and advocates of art this country has ever produced. George continues to speak and educate the public on the importance of art, which depends on fostering a culture that respects and actively supports both artistic and academic freedom. Please join me in welcoming George Randall. Thank you, all. Thank you for your uh, fights for social justice and thank you for being here at the Art Institute a half years ago, where you were building a portfolio for an MFA. Uh, uh, Program and, and he ended up with many master's levels uh, accomplishments after that. Um, I took the other route, of course. Um, after art school here in 76, I went right into the studio and uh, worked for other artists to finance my own unsaleable projects, um, working for Bill Reed and, uh, and Gene Heistein and Jack Harmon, who had the art foundry in east of Gastown. And uh, 
One of the things I did when I was working for, for Jack Farman was I helped him make a monument to the president of UBC. So the, they say the fruit doesn't fall far from the tree. <laughs> so you know the, the, the whole notion of making a monument to a university president comes with a kind of precedent here. Okay, I've been involved in that before. The difference is that that was a different era when 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 funding was in place, and and Norman Mackenzie really deserved to be uh, monumentalized. I'm into anti-monumentalization here. It's a slightly different tact. There's a deconstructive element to this. <laughs> that, that, uh, it's a monument, but it's also an anti-monument. Um, you know, my friend Ian Angus wrote a book called Love the Questions. And Love the Questions is amazing because it looks at corporate interference in the university, nationwide, North America-wide. It looks at the failure of universities to maintain themselves as a place of enlightenment. And, and the problem with public-private partnerships, the problem with corporate interference in the ownership of knowledge, it's huge. And we're all under attack. I mean, look at, look at, look at the, the Harper um, attack on science right now. It's happening everywhere. And uh, anyway, Love the Questions is interesting because Ian Angus also goes in to the way university administrators are using budget restrictions as an excuse to push their agendas through, okay? At, at the expense of traditions of consultation. And that's huge. Um, anyway, people, I once tried to make up um, uh, an Anthony Carroll as an experiment, and it was, it was easy to get it to work from one point of view, but to get it to work 360 was almost impossible. And what I tried to do with this piece was to get it to work 360 degrees. So we have an honorary guest here today. Uh, the, the painter laureate of Canada, Gordon Smith, is going to unveil our piece today. And I'm, I'm really honored to have Gordon here. Um, Gordon is the most generous and inspiring artist I know. And he paints every day. <laughs> he gets up in the morning and he paints. And, and that's incredible. Um, He's never, he's never not painted. He's, he's, he's passionate about art, he's passionate about culture, passionate about education, and that's why he's here today, to show his support. Um, after he pulls off the veil, I was hoping everybody could do a 360 around the piece, because there is no front, there is no back. Okay? Wow. And I could even walk you through it, because the piece reads like a Christian narrative. You know, it reads like iconography. There's, 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 there's meaning to each part. Um, I can't believe I did this. <laughs> <laughs> Is, uh, inaugurated, they need a mace 
which, which serves as the basis of symbol of the trust you invest in your leader. So when that leader violates Canadian laws in the governance of the university, there's a violation of that trust. Well, often the Squamish First Nations artist carved the mace in, in a 500-year-old piece of yew wood, which Bill Kirchin donated, and, and he did a beautiful job. Now, I, I've talked to Malacton. He's very supportive of this, okay? Um, uh, what I did was a satire on that as well. So we have the eagle is getting choked here. Uh, <laughs> we have the bear holding the laptop. <laughs> then we have the screw. <laughs> The, uh, the, uh, the grand hat, of course, that comes with obvious connotations of power. It's all about power. Um, the poodle. Why do I have a poodle? Okay. Uh, you know, I love dogs. I've got to get a shark. Nancy and I have a beautiful dog. We, we, I, I love having dogs at work. Ben, my coworker, brings his dog to work. I don't know how we got away with it. Because the facilities <laughs> always went around saying, you're not allowed to bring your dog to work. And so they would guard us, they would police us. Okay? Uh, no dogs. But the president gets to bring your dog to work again. And, and it drives me crazy that there's two layers of rules. One, one for that and one for us. And, and so, the dog is also a metaphor. Okay? So we're going to get Oh my god, that's great. <laughs> We have blind the American flag. Uh, we needed to bring someone in from outside Canada to show us how it's done. <laughs> I find that really peculiar, especially when those Canadian laws have to be respected in the governance of the university. Um, oh. 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 This is the original. This was the one that I made in April of last year, which was confiscated, uh, confiscated and, and eventually destroyed. It came back in a heap. I think that was a weird message. Um, <laughs> it's a message that you'd expect in Iran or China. It's not the kind of message you expect in Canada, okay? This is political caricature. Um, it's legal in Canada. It's protected under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, I thought. <laughs> Um, but apparently not. Symbol of signing authority. I mean, this is all very literal iconography in a way, isn't it? Um, yeah. So, it's very interactive. You can play with it. Um, it's, you know, it's it. Yeah. Who made the poodle earrings? Sorry? Who made the poodle earrings? I carved those in stainless steel. Is it dark? In dog, we trust. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh. What is your dog's name? Margo. That's what I okay. Margo and the Monarch. Okay, that's what I was wondering. Okay, yeah. You know, it's, it's yeah. We're going to back up a bit here. You know, when the Cubs were announced last April, it was a real shock because Cap was built on public and, and there's always a process around cuts and, and, and departments who were given sometimes years, for instance, in horticulture to address the, the budget problems. And, and it was, it, the whole institution was built on the history of consultation. The 40 retired, retired faculty um, wrote a book that Bill Sprungrucker edited. And it's called, um, it's called The Dialogue Continues. And this, this was a book that the, um, these 40 retired faculty that built Cap University wrote as homework for the board and Senate to read, right? So they understand the importance of consultation. It's an amazing read. Pierre, you had a lot to do with this. A little bit. A little bit. Pierre has been our, our forefront soldier. And, and Jennifer O'Keefe, where's Jennifer? Now running for co when you work for 24 years in a program and, and you know people like my colleague Tiki Mulvihill here. Put your hand up, Tiki. 
I mean, you know, all the work we do, like not only teaching, but, but, but you know, designing curricula and, 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 and the kind of infrastructure that goes into that on a weekly basis. And, and to have that pulled out from under you with no opportunity for dialogue whatsoever, it was, it was very peculiar. Um, when we tried to address that, when, when the community of North Dan, the North Shore, and the larger community in the province sent letters to Bolkroff explaining these problems, she simply wrote that off as, as na they called them nasty letters, nasty letters, okay? Um, and so and we tried everything. We weren't getting anywhere. We weren't being heard. There was obviously an agenda work. I mean, she's a sociologist, and she's really good at using sympathy to, to get her way. Which, and, and you know, that's why I did this piece. It's, it was therapy. It was a summer of therapy. Okay? Nancy says the therapy's got to be over with. <laughs> 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 okay. but, but the thing is, uh, uh, where was I? <laughs> In therapy. In therapy. I, yeah. um, so, so one, one thing we did was we, we, we painted these massive banners, these massive fabric banners that were you know, 30 feet long. And then the university had them taken down and trashed. And, and so we, you know, it's unbelievable. Like we weren't even allowed to have a voice on campus. I mean, is, is this Canada or what? You know, I mean, when, when your own protest banners are being destroyed by administration, you think, okay, this is nuts. So uh, I did a request to make an effigy, effigy meaning like a puppet. And, and I, I don't care what you call this. I mean, to me, it doesn't matter what you call it. A puppet, a caricature, you know, um, a ventriloquist dummy. Uh, I, don't, I don't care what you call it. It's art. You know, it's still art. And nobody has the right to destroy your art. Nobody has the right to give it back to you in a heap. You know, really. I mean, you know, they asked me what I needed in retribution. And I, I, I insisted, I mean, you know, quite frankly, it's not about the peace, okay? It's not about the peace. It, it's, it's about the principle of this whole thing. The, the lack of consultation. And even when our colleagues worked to put together a highly viable economic alternative to keep drawing classes open for academic students or whatever, they, they, they wouldn't even look at it. Do you have anything to add to it? <laughs> Yay for George. <laughs> so, uh, but you know, the, the interesting thing is I really felt like I was under attack. I mean, it, it's a weird deal. Because I remember in my first studio in U.S. Minster, some hockey players came into my studio when I was carving a reflection in it. And, and you know, I'm not against hockey players, believe me. I used to play hockey as a kid. But they, they all looked at my work. But there was one guy who was sneering at me. And I think he was having a discussion on the stage. He said, I'm going to get you. This, this is sissy and stuff. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you. So that night, my studio door was kicked open. My piece, my piece was in pieces all over the I mean, it took months to put it all back together, right? And, and, and this was the same. I mean, this was vandalism with a PhD. <laughs> you know? It's vandalism. Yeah. George, how did they justify that? How did they, they justified it by saying that they owned it because it was made by faculty. And if you take that to its logical extension, then they can go into anyone's office. They can take any creative property that you make as faculty and take it in the night without any consultation whatsoever. Total avoidance. I, mean, I don't have a problem with them having a problem with it. I mean, universities should be a polemic. But, 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 but to go around the grievance process and to just make this, the, the head of the board, Jane Chappell, made this arbitrary decision on her own, the same way Chris Bullcroft made an arbitrary decision to cut her programs without consultation, you know, to, 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 to trash my work. Okay? And, and, yeah. You know, they broken up into parts was so they could fit it into a vehicle. Yeah, I've moved that thing myself many times. Like myself. It fits through a 32-inch door. They said they had to cut it up to move it. I mean, it, it just goes on and on up there. Sure. You know, they also claimed it was harassment of the president. Yeah, they claimed it was harassment of the president. Like, since when is political caricature harassment? And they have harassment policies at the institution that they could have gone through. Yeah. And they had really believed it was harassment. Yeah, I mean, this is a puppet for God's sake. I mean, you know, the, the other thing I find interesting, people, is that, is that the university can ignore letters of protest. You know, letters that talk about how unhealthy she is, they can just ignore those. 
know, but for some reason they can't ignore a three-dimensional puppet. I mean, why, what is it? What's that about? Because it's public. You know, it's also, George, because a government without a sense of humor yeah. is a dictator. <laughs> and that's it here. If she had laughed at this, it wouldn't have had any power left. So, you know, like, and, and, and interestingly enough, some of my union leaders <laughs> have been very supportive. <laughs> I don't know what I'd do without you. I mean, I rode up that hill to cap on my bike. I felt like I was on a motorcycle. I didn't even need a pedal. I mean, I was by and by. Especially if you were better, Sandra, Sandra Seekins. Uh, amazing writer. <laughs> You know, I really believe CAP is an amazing institution. It could have an amazing future, but it needs a new leader. It really does. Please, pitch in. Sorry, George, but we also, uh, uh, you're absolutely right, uh, but we also need more commitment to public funding to education throughout this province. Education is being starved, and I don't think that it reflects what people in this province really want. We want to have our our institutions funded properly and our teachers at all levels funded properly, but this particular government isn't doing it. In fact, funding for education, in my view, from what, I'm under, from what I understand, is decreasing under this particular regime. I think it behooves all of us to speak to that level of our quality and governance in order to ensure that we have the kind of funding that would allow for brilliant programs like Studio York to actually remain in place and continue here, it's not just funding decreasing, it's being offloaded on the students. And that is one of the worst things because it means the student debt loads that you students here are now having to suffer and that are burdening your futures are going to increase. And to me, that's criminal. I urge you all to take a look at the Finnish model of education. If you're not familiar with it, just Google it and begin to find out a little bit about it. You know, the, the other thing I found really, really supportive here is that I, I, at first I was really scared, you know, like you're taking on these lawyers, lawyer types and administ top administrators, and it's really scary. I mean, I, I took on a similar thing when I challenged the Bill Reed Foundation years ago about, about producing um, editions of, of, of counterfeits of Bill Reed's work, and I talked down. I was trying to educate lawyers on reproduction, and my God, it's, it's a challenge, it's scary, but it's worth it. Um, but, but having, having the support of COT, which stands for the Canadian Association of University Teachers, COT, remember that. Because I can, you see, major universities like SFU and UBC have academic freedom. Academic freedom is the fundamental principle of, for an educator, in that you have the freedom to, to teach as you see fit, without repercussions, without being chastised for your beliefs. It's fundamental to, to a free society, right? Now, Emily Carr, the fact that you don't have academic freedom here is absolutely bizarre. I mean, the, a, a, a creative institution like the Emily Carr, Emily would be horrified, <laughs> you know, that you don't have that. But, but you know, I discovered that, in fact, you do. You do have it. Because just by the nature of being an educator in Canada at a university, you, you have the support of the Canadian Association of University Teachers. And whoa, do they ever swoop in like angels when you need help. Holy smokes. I mean, they, 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 are, they are working to help the university understand that they need to change their behavior. And I think, wow, this is amazing. Thank God for that. So, in fact, you do have academic freedom. It's just not formally written in your contract with the university, that's all. Am I, am I right, Jason, Jason Brown? Uh, maybe I can speak to that. Uh, it's in our policies in the university. There are policies, but it's not in our collective agreement. I know, but it... Sure, uh, thanks, George. In terms of the legal side, it's much better and much stronger for faculty members to have the academic freedom in your collective agreement. But in a case like this, uh, CAT will, as you say, swoop in and publicly shame the university for uh, preventing you from displaying the type of art. And we have to have our public institutions be the bastion of free speech and to be able to challenge. And when there's a controversial issue that comes up, uh, decrease in funding, 
closure programs. We should be able to have a broad debate. And where else do you want to have that debate but at a, a university? What are our public universities for? We must protect our free speech and our academic freedom. So CAUT will step in. We're working on a report uh, that will be presented to the uh, university and negotiations will take place in a public venue so that the university will be held accountable, whether it's in the collective agreement or not, for the type of institution that we want to have in this province. So here, here. chasing a bus full of students over the bridge in the morning traffic on the Second Arrows, in the morning light, and, and it, it, I, 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 I think it's brilliant. I don't know. <laughs> you can see the colors of the flag reflected in the bus window, and you can hear, you can hear um, uh, this amazing music in the background, you know, the charge. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if you bought sound, but... Jonathan Contra Swindy helped me with this, and and um, Charles Dobson helped me use some editing. It was great. Thank God for media wizards. Ah. I'm a media dinosaur. <laughs> By which I mean don't consult. It's a waste of time. Oh, <laughs> no, no, I, 
I I sort of, but I'm not into that. Okay. You know, you know, there's enough money being milked out of the system. I mean, Jennifer worked to, through the Freedom of Information Act to find abuses of money dipping that's been going on. I mean, I mean, there's 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 issues out there that money is not flowing. You know, and, and uh, you want to talk to that, Jennifer? Question um, with regard to the question you started, you opened up with regard to the actual the monitoring or the scrutiny of the people that are actually given the position or put in these positions of power. Are what what kind of legislation is there to actually scrutinise their behaviour? If this is obviously a, 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 you know if they've contravened um, university um, directives or policy, uh, you know wh where is the legislative body for this? And I well, don't it's understand. The of that particular institution, uh, but what I mean uh, external to these institutions, are there are there mm -hmm. governing bodies that are external to any one particular institution that does the job of monitoring monitoring the behavior of administrators? My my guess would be the Ministry of Higher Education would be the only other right. body that you know that would play that role. They don't seem the least bit interested in what's happened at Catalano. Right. And so you know there there seems to be this you know disconnection. Quite. 
So, and then in a sense, they're protected by the fact that there's no other legislating body to, there's no other body to kind of scrutinize or monitor the regulation. That I know of, no. Okay. So it's a problem. Just a small point, uh, I think we have to remember that in Quebec, the students went on strike and marched in the streets for months at a time to protest the uh, increases in tuition there, even though apparently they have some of the lowest tuition fees in the country. Not that I'm trying to provoke you to go out on the street and demonstrate as they are in Hong Kong and they've done there, but I think there needs to be more public awareness of how funding for education is being starved in this province. And I think more and more people have to become outspoken about that and write to their MLAs and write to their local councils or whatever you have to do in order to make people more aware. I think it is a question of public education. I think that is tragic that this has happened at CAP at this time when you have the Gordon Smith Gallery for Canadian Art that just opened recently. We have the Ordain Foundation making a new gallery in Whistler. We just heard this morning Kathleen Bartels and the representatives of you're all in the group, so, but look, they can't get the name right, right now. Uh, and they're speaking today about the plans to build a new Vancouver Art Gallery. When the arts in so many sectors in this province are getting support and are being built and are seen as a vital part of the future of this place and of this city, to have this happen at Capilano, where it could have been a partner in all of these things and a contributor to all of these things, is now no longer a player at all. And so many students are being done a disservice on the North Shore. Especially when Chris has been pontificating the value of visceral activity and interdisciplinary yeah. activity in the arts, and yet those are the very things that are getting caught. That's right. So it just doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. But it means that we all have to be a little bit more proactive in how we address these issues.
language into their collective agreement, uh, perhaps, or, for example, discuss the issue of students' protest banners or faculty banners being written down, discuss it publicly as a place where certain types of behavior might be considered unacceptable, and try to negotiate with them to make some changes to the way things are done. So those are some of the things that probably be discussed with the senior leadership of the CAD and the university. You know, people, the one thing I was concerned about with this was appearing cynical, you know. Um, having like, why, why would I resort to satire? And it's only because all else failed. Okay, that's why I did this, and it was very therapeutic. But, but I, I don't normally, my work, my work isn't normally, I, normally I embed my politics deep into the work so the viewer really has to wrestle to find it. I, I've never made overtly political work like this. You know, but I had to in this case. It was just, it had to be prophesied. You know? I'm actually quite a shy person. I mean, I'm not confident. But it was a good, it was a good therapy. I feel better now. <laughs> yeah. Now that you feel better, what do you have vision for your future and what you're going to do? I well, I want to do a portrait of Stephen Harper. <laughs> and buckets of fresh steaming <laughs> bullshit. Pack <laughs> it into the hole. And it, it's really the casting material is a metaphor. It, it, ironically, it's more valuable than gold in terms of sustenance. You know what I mean? It, it, it really, it's really influenced by this guy, Greg Schneider. Really. I mean, Greg, Greg is a real mentor of mine in terms of education. And, and one of the things he did was, was, was give his students um, found, found, Ditrious material from the community to respond to. Do something, but turn that into something. And, and the, the finished thing has to still have the presence of what the original material was when it started. And so it kicked something off for me, and I've been doing that for years, you know. And and and, and so and and, and so uh, you know the 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 use of well, I actually started collecting bear shit, which is really valuable to me. I'm doing a series of castings of bear shit, but you know the the, the bullshit is a well, it's, it's really a metaphor for spin. I mean, I've got a lot of other things I want to get up. Like, I've got better things to do than make monuments to university presidents, believe me. I've got much better things to do, it, but, you know, it had to be done. It had to be done. <laughs> it, it, re it revived my interest in portraiture. By the way, my great-grandfather was a portrait artist who, who painted with important Canadians in Central Canada back in the 19-teens. And he painted, he painted, um, what was going on in the First World War with spiritual paintings long before the group set up, you know. So, so it's kind of interesting how, you know, going to art school is the ultimate thing you could do because that individual in our family had accomplished something that goes way beyond what anybody else in the family had ever done, you know. And it's like, wow, you can do this too. <laughs> right, Gordon?